Thanks, Mickey, for helping us in this event. And now for something completely different. Uh, I've been personally very excited to learn who our uh, honorary guest will be in the event today. Uh, and we prepared a short uh, segment uh, for that. But before we start, I would like to uh, ask all to uh, acknowledge our guests. So sitting over there in the first row, straight from uh, Budapest, Hungary, Professor Erno Rubik, the inventor of the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> Say hi. Thank you, Professor, for being here. We prepared a short uh, presentation to, for you to see, so you can still remain sitting down and we'll we show you uh, something we have prepared. And later on, you'll be on stage and we'll ask you questions and everybody here could ask questions or prepare your questions. And I would like to uh, invite the stage. I, I said already I'm excited, but today I'm also excited because all my worlds are colliding. We're talking about the game I'm fascinated by for 20 years, 21 years which I haven't won yet, the Rubik's Cube. We're inviting to stage a dear friend that I used to perform with on stages around the world, and we're talking about, about games and the game industry. So without further ado, Mr. Shuka Bergman, master of Rubik, Rubik's Cube. How's everybody doing? This is going to be difficult because it's very difficult to talk about the Rubik's Cube with the inventor sitting in front of me. Uh, I'm here on very, very short notice. I am literally going to wing this. So bear with me as I attempt to take you on a tiny little tour through the amazing world of the Rubik's Cube. Now, I won't bore you with my own personal story. I am a cube enthusiast. Uh, some say a fanatic, others say I'm an addict. Probably all three are true. Uh, I first met the Cube in 1981 when Cube Madness hit Israel. I am one of those people who actually solved it on their own. Uh, I see a lot of frustrated people looking at me. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's been a long love story with the Cube. I've done many things with the Cube over the years. It's been a large part of my life. Thank you very much, Professor Rubik. And um, these days, I mostly work with gifted children. Now, these are very, very bright children with skyscraping IQs, and I work on all sorts of extracurricular things with them. One of the things I do is I incorporate the cube into my lessons in an attempt to teach them to, to improve their problem-solving abilities and to help them think more logically. They already can think quite logically, trying to do it even more so. So let's, let's go back 40 years for a moment. Uh, I'm sure Professor Rubik has told the story a million times and is probably not interested in doing it again. I'll make this very brief. The story of the invention of the cube is actually a rather serendipitous one and uh, a rather ingenious one as well. He was not intending to create a puzzle. It was created for totally other, uh, different purposes that had to do with the university course he was teaching at the time. And if you think about it, it's really quite remarkable that there are all these separate pieces that can move around different axes, totally autonomous, yet it doesn't fall apart. And I think the first amazing thing he did was to dream this up and to actually manage to construct something like this. When you take it apart, it looks quite simple. You can see how it's constructed, but coming up with the idea and not fearing failure and actually working on constructing something that is not, cannot obviously be built, I think is quite an achievement. The second achievement he had with the cube was he was the first person to actually solve it. Now, it took him several months to do it, okay? But he had no help from anyone. By the way, uh, I said I solved it on my own. My claim to fame with the cube is I have never come across or heard of anyone who actually solved it faster than myself. It took me exactly four hours in one session the very same day I bought the cube. But I had a huge, huge advantage over Professor Rubik. 
I knew it could be done. It's much harder to take on a challenge when you have absolutely no idea whether your effort will bear any fruit. So I think his achievement in solving it, even though it took considerably longer than, than it took me, is a much greater one nonetheless. The third amazing thing he did with the cube was being able to market it, even though all the experts said there was basically no market for it. This is a very hard problem. It's basically for adults, but it looks like a toy. So basically only children would buy it. And this is basically what he was told, that there was simply no reasonable market for the cube. And boy, were they wrong. <laughs> as soon as the cube hit the market, it sold like wildfire. The production lines couldn't keep up with it. I had a hard time buying one when they got to Israel. Everyone was, all the stores were sold out. Um, anyway, so in the 1980s, at first, there were just cubes. There was nothing else to go along with the cubes. And the big question was, how on earth do you solve this thing? And people were going crazy over it. There were all sorts of clubs and people were helping each other and working on it. Some luckier people like me actually managed to do it, but we were few and far between. And after a while, there was a booklet published with, all, with a, a simple solution and various other solutions were, were uh, popping up. And the next question was, how fast can you actually solve it? And this led to the first world championships in 1982 in a sport called speed cubing. Now, I'm also a speed cuber. I participated in the uh, 2009 World Championships. I didn't win. I only came in about 200th out of about 400 participants. I held my own. Uh, but the standards have gone up over the years quite a bit. The first world record in 1982 was 22.95 seconds. I'm a mediocre speed cuber, and that's a bad time for me. And this was actually the official record for 21 years. What happened was Cube Madness kind of died out and then was revived again with the internet where cubers all over the world could start uh, communicating with each other. And since 2003, there has been a world championship every two years. In fact, every weekend of the year, there is at least one Rubik's Cube Championship, if not more, somewhere in the world. It is that popular. We've already had three Israeli championships. I'm one of the organizers. Hey, I made the finals twice, um, but I am not the champion. And the Israeli record has dropped down. Well, I didn't talk about records. Maybe I'll uh, create a little bit of suspense. Um, so the first record was just, uh, just short of 23 seconds. There was no official competition during the, uh, during the 80s, even though uh, some people were solving in around 16, 17 seconds, which is roughly what I can do. Um, the second World Championship in 2003. Also, I should mention that people are always interested in what is the record. Well, record is relatively meaningless when you're talking about a Rubik's Cube. It's sort of like asking, what is the record, world record in running to a uh, random distance? Well, that's obviously not very meaningful. So in competition, what actually counts is average times. You do several solves, and ultimately the average time is what counts. So the winning average time in 2003 was 20 seconds. In 2005 was 15 seconds. 2007 was 12 and a half seconds. Where I participated in 2009 was 10 and 3 quarter seconds. And now the fastest cubers in the world are regularly doing averages that are sub 10 seconds. In fact, the last world champion actually averages sub nine seconds. I'm happy to say the Israeli record is now below 10 seconds. Um, okay, so should we do something a little bit more visual possibly? By the way, maybe I'll just mention that, that the main events in these competitions is just speed solving the cube, but there are many other events too. First of all, there are various other as they call them, twisty puzzles. Uh, but the basic cube is still the main, the main uh, event. There are events like solving the cube with one hand. The fastest cubers with one hand do it faster than I do with two hands.
quite amazing, amazing dexterity. Um, there is solving the cube with a minimum amount of moves, which is very difficult. You have a solid hour to try, which is not very much time, to try where everyone has the cube scrambled exactly the same to try to find the shortest path you can back to the solved state. Very difficult competition. Uh, there, are, there are very strange things like solving the cube with your feet. And the world record is somewhere around 30 seconds. There is blindfold solving of the Rubik's Cube, which is quite amazing. I can actually do it, but it takes me a very, very long time. Uh, you want to see? Oh, let's see a video of someone blind solving the cube. I'm also proud to say that the very first world champion in blind solving the Rubik's Cube is Israeli. I noticed something interesting about this video. Oh no, okay. This, this, is, this cube is uh, not a cube that would be allowed in the competition, but possibly still for blind solving. Maybe it still is a legal cube. If you notice, the time includes the time it takes him to memorize the cube. It takes me about 25 minutes to memorize a cube, so I won't be demonstrating that. So he wasn't sure he got it. If you could see at the end that he's even checking yeah. to see if he got it right. In blind solving, averages are not taken into account because actually most of the solves end up with a cube not solved because there are so many things that can go wrong. Everything from memorizing it wrong to wrong execution to just one tiny little wrong move and, and the cube simply won't be solved at the end. So, um, I, I once asked a speed cuber, a, a blind solver, what his average time was, and he said, DNF, which means did not finish. His average time, yeah. Okay, um, th by the way, there's even multi-blind solving, where you solve, you have to declare how many cubes you will solve, and you have to memorize all of them and solve them all within an hour limit, and your score is actually the ones you solved minus the ones you didn't solve. Um, should I actually demonstrate a speed solve? Uh, what do you say? Do, we, do you want to say something? <laughs> no, no, I, we can't hear anything. We're so high up here, we can't hear you. Do you want okay. to see a demonstration? Okay. Uh, yeah, here, okay, yeah, while, while you're um, uh, scrambling the cube, um, speed cubing is actually very, a very different skill from sol actually solving the puzzle because you're using a method that you already know. The vast majority of speed cubers just learned methods from other cubers or these days it's mostly from YouTube. And uh, it requires very good recognition skills and, and it, you work with your fingers a lot using um, all sorts of finger tricks as they call them. But the really hard part is actually recognition. Figuring out what you have to do next is not very difficult. And you see the very best cubers literally don't stop twisting, which are simply amazing recognition skills. OK. Is the cube scrambled? Do you want me to scramble? Do you want the, 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 our guest to scramble? What, what do you want to do? Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I am um, actually. <laughs> seeing as Anna Rubik created the cube, and he was the first to solve it. I can only assume he was the first to scramble it as well. <laughs> so here it is scrambled by the original scrambler. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, let's see, maybe I'll tell you a few things while I'm trying. Oh, I can't do that because I don't have free hands. Okay. I won't be doing a one-handed solve. Okay, you actually have about, you have 15 seconds to start a speed solve. Um, what am I gonna do with this? Okay, let's do something like this. Just about all the speed cubers use the same method to solve the cube. I do not though. I use a hybrid between my own method and another ingenious method created by a Frenchman by the name of Gilles Roux. And the cube is solved. Okay. Uh, 
By the way, beyond competition, there are all sorts of other interesting things uh, to do with the Rubik's Cube. It's, it's become an icon, as you surely know. It's been used in campaigns, in advertising. There's one advertisement here, a Citroen advertisement. I actually participated in a, uh, in a TV commercial with the Rubik's Cube, something for some broadband internet, and the idea was to compare it with the speed of their internet access. This photo is a very famous one. I'm sure you recognize it. However, this is totally made up of Rubik's Cubes. I don't recall the number. It's a rather large one. I, I seem to remember the number 12,000, but I could be wrong. Um, more than 12,000. More than 12,000. I, I was close. <laughs> okay, the Dalai Lama. There are actually competitions, artistic competitions as well. These are group competitions where they, you have some 200 cubes to create a uh, mosaic of this sort. Unfortunately, this, uh, this is another puzzle, twisty puzzle. This is the uh, uh, Terraminx. I don't have any, and the uh, Megaminx, more mosaics. This is a tiny little mosaic I made with 20 cubes. I actually wanted to make an Israeli cube an Israeli flag, excuse me, but uh, with such low resolution, I couldn't make the Star of David. So I did the sort of pseudo-American flag instead. And these are various other, other puzzles and competitions. These are not in competitions, but also similar. This is the, this is the Terraminx. Okay. Um, other amazing things done with the Rubik's Cube. There was a challenge some years ago uh, to use Lego uh, NXT um, robotic kits to create a cube that, uh, uh, excuse me, a robot that will solve a cube faster than any human being. This is the fastest one to date. I don't think any human beings will be solving quite that fast, even though the world record is down to, how about we see it? This is someone I have to put on my kill list. Once again, a record is never really counts in, com in competition. Or maybe I didn't say this. Uh, your average never includes your fastest solve or slowest solve because there's too much luck involved. Yet another thing people have been doing with the cube for the last number of years is what has become to be known as extreme cubing. This is Dan Knight's, the 2003 world champion, solving the cube while tandem skydiving in freefall. If that slips from his hands, <laughs> it will not survive the fall.